Welcome to this edition of Project of the Week. Each week I'm going to recreate a project in Grasshopper that is chosen by my subscribers and followers. This week we will be examining spatial 3D printing techniques made popular in research institutions such as the Bartlett and 3D printing specialist AI Build. Traditional 3D printing relies on a layered system to build a form. We will examine a method that relies on a cantilever of material to create a voxelized spatial printing technique. We will apply this technique to a surface, then learn how to program an industrial robot through a singular toolpath. To complete this tutorial, you will need the robots plugin for Grasshopper installed. This plugin is open source and Grasshopper files can be found at github.com slash vsos slash robots slash releases. You will also need li the libraries folder containing the different types of robots available to use in the plugin. You can find these at github.com slash vsos slash robots. Please make sure you have copied the contents of the libraries folder into a folder called robots located in your documents folder. This is necessary because the robots plugin will locate these files at the location on your computer when it tries to load a robot. The final thing you need to do to complete this tutorial is to grab the Rhino template file, which can be downloaded from the differentdesign.com and is available to all registered users. This file contains a base surface we will use as well as some end effectors to attach to our robot. We're going to simulate a plastic extrusion program on an industrial robot during the main part of this tutorial, and then at the end we're going to add a little bonus task where we chuck a chainsaw onto our robot and simulate it slicing along a simple toolpath through space. I'm going to begin just by referencing this surface geometry, and so let's just create a surface container and set one surface, and then I'm going to turn this base surface layer off. Then I'm just going to create a square grid. Um, that can be found under curves, no sorry, under uh, vector I think, under grid, if you want a square one. I'm going to give it an extent of 25 and 25 and what we're going to do is we're going to map this grid onto uh, this surface basically. So to do that let's go ahead and create a bounding box. I meant to right click on this and make it a union box and flatten all of the content coming into it which will be all of these cells. Um, so we can't see this right now, it's over at the origin. Um, over here, but basically we're just creating a box around it. I'm then going to deconstruct the brep, so the brep that's on fire there, and just get an item, a list item of that face. So item zero is fine for what we're after, and we're going to go ahead and map to surface. So we're going to map um, all of these cells coming out of here, um, that we're going to go from the source surface of this to a target surface over here. And you'll see straight away we get a nice grid on top of that surface. So I'll preview a few of these guys off, like so. And so now what we want to do is we essentially want to create kind of um, voxels or boxes um, on top of this grid. So we want to make it three dimensional. We're not going to do like an offset surface because the offset surface won't actually give us the offset we want. The offset we want is actually going to be in a flat direction because we're 3D printing. If we were to do an offset surface, it would offset by the normals of the surface and come below this kind of like XY plane. So if we were doing a 3D print and that was our printing bed, we wouldn't want that. We want our layers to be kind of flat like this kind of contour that we have here. So we're going to do a little bit of a different kind of technique to map these boxes on. I'm going to go ahead and create a discontinuity component and I am going to get the discontinuity of all of these um, mapped curves and I am then going to do a surface closest point and I'm actually going to reparameterize this surface because I'm going to grab the UV points out of this. So I'll go surfaces into there and then all of these points coming out of discontinuity into here. And then I'm going to evaluate that surface at these UV points, like so. So that's going to give me a bunch of points and normals. So if I were to go and create like a vector display, um, we'd be able to see like where the normals at each point of the surface are. And you can see the point I was saying here, that some of these arrows are kind of pointing down. Now we don't want to offset these uh, kind of voxels downwards. We want to offset them across kind of almost like in an X and Y plane. So what we'll do instead of the offset is we're going to deconstruct the vector. Um, of this normal here, and then we're going to reconstruct it. I'm actually going to grab it from construct vector up here, um, and we're only going to take the x and y values of this. So we don't want the z value, which is giving it that kind of like downwards offset. Then we're going to create a vector amplitude, 
Um, I'm going to plug the vector into there and I'm going to give it an amplitude of maybe 20.00. That's the size of our offset for now. It's basically what the size of our voxel is going to be. And we're going to move um, some of those points from here from this evaluate surface in the direction of that vector like that. So you see now if I were to go and look at this in elevation, um, we get these movements all happening on kind of like these um, planar kind of transformations before if we kind of put that in you'd get these kind of weird offsets and we don't want that with the Z components. So I'm just going to undo that quickly. Um, so that's basically to kind of fall in line with this um, kind of leveled 3D printing logic that we're going for in this tutorial. So now the data that we've coming out of this move component has kind of four points, which represents one voxel over here, for example, on its branch. So if I hover over there, you've got all these branches with four points on them. And then the tree coming out of discontinuity also has like corresponding four points for each square. So what we now want to do is create essentially a twisted box from um, these points. So if I go and make a twisted box component, um, which is that one there, um, you can find it under the, I think, transformation tab. I think it's under morph. Yep, twisted boxes there. We're going to basically specify all the corner points that we want in this box. Um, right now, it's going to be a little bit tricky for us to go and plug in um, with the current data tree that we've got. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip uh, the matrix coming out of here. And then we're going to have, oops, I need to... Um, just have a look at the data structure back here. Something's gone a little bit wrong. Ah, uh, yeah, just flatten coming out of map to surface. We don't want this data structure from the start coming out. You could, probably could have flattened its cells actually if you wanted to. So now I've got this flip matrix and it's a much simpler data structure coming out of there. So we've got our four on those leaves. We flip it and then basically we've got four list containers coming out of here. So we could go ahead and explode the um, tree um, like this and we'll get those four branches. And those are gonna be the lower corners of the box. We can plug them in order. And we're actually gonna do the same transformation just coming out of these discontinuity points over here. And those guys are gonna come into there like that. And then we'll have created a series of twisted boxes um, basically mapped onto that surface. So I might go ahead and just turn a few of these guys off now that we've got that working and that's looking pretty good so far. So the reason we haven't gone and used something like paneling tools or um, you know these other plugins is because we want to get that 3D printing logic embedded where we've got these kind of levels going on with these voxelized forms. So the next step in this process is we're going to basically um, embed a little kind of voxel on each of these um, twisted boxes that kind of has this 3D printing polyline in it. So I'm actually going to start with a um, center box um, like this. And I'm, I mean, it doesn't really matter how big it is, but I'll just make it like some kind of reasonable size so we can actually see it. In fact, we'll just zoom into it over here. And I am going to go ahead and deconstruct the brep like that and we're gonna use the vertices. And I'm gonna get some list items from these vertices here. So I'll grab these vertices and I'm just gonna preview that guy off. Um, and I've kind of preconceived these numbers. You can go and put them in any order you want, but this is basically going to get us the 3D printing logic that um, we're after in this tutorial. Uh, it's not strict or anything, but it basically just gets it in an order that enables it to create a continuous um, robotic toolpath layer in the tutorial. So the order I'm gonna go for is two, one, six, five, three, seven, six, two, three, one. So copy those numbers down, two, one, six, five, three, seven, six, two, three, one. And we're gonna plug them into the indices over here. Just make sure you make it multi-line data so um, it comes through as a list properly. I might just move all these guys down a little bit and give myself a bit more room up here. Um, and then we're gonna just create a polyline through those points. And basically what it's actually doing is it's kind of starting off at a point. Um, so for example, if we just you know started off at point two, um, we're starting off at this point here, and then we're ending up at point one, which is, I think is over here. And you can imagine if this was like our surface, we're going to kind of basically print all the way around here, end up on that side, then print all the way around here, and then end up on that side. So we're basically creating a linear motion where this kind of like um, 
Toolpath visits enough on this um, little box to create like these little voxels. And these edges are actually going to get covered when um, the voxels start to stack on top of each other. So now I'm going to go and apply these to the um, twisted box. So I'm going to go back and zoom into those guys again. And we're going to do that with a box morph component. Um, so that one there, the box morph, I think that's once again found under transformation, yep, just above the twisted box. So the geometry we're going to morph is that polyline. Um, the reference box will be that center box that we started with, and the target box is going to be this twisted box here, like that. So now we've kind of got um, this really interesting kind of 3D printable lattice structure that I was kind of talking about in some of those kind of inspiration projects that um, I was mentioning at the start of the tutorial. So the logic we want to embed in this now basically is we want to have a continuous um, polyline curve. So I mentioned before that this voxel is going to kind of go and meet every kind of line of that voxel, then move to the next one, then move to the next one. So you can imagine it's going to create a nice continuous path all the way along here. So if I create a, like a um, list item component and grab the items from this and maybe made it a value of, I don't know, 20 just to start with. So where does that get us to? Oh, sorry, that's from the top. Let's reverse that order. Um, so if I go from there, that's zero. And you can kind of see we're going to get this logic that goes all the way across over here, all the way over here. We're going to have an issue here, see? We do a huge jump. And whilst you can do this in 3D printing, it's much more logical for us to go from this little voxel straight up to this one because then you don't have issues, say for example, if you're printing with like a hot plastic or a hot metal, you don't have issues with like the cooling um, having an effect on the bond between the material. So what we'll do is we're going to manipulate the um, data structure a little bit. I'm just going to reverse that guy coming out of box more first, and then I'm going to partition the list so we get a bit of a data structure back into it. Right now it's a flat list. And the size of the partitions, we're going to come back to the start and grab this 25 that we started with. So we're almost going back. To, we're basically, what we're doing now is we're going to have like a row of 25, then another row of 25. But essentially what we're trying to do now is we're trying to keep this row in its current order, and we're trying to reverse the um, order of this row. So we go this way, then up, and this way, and then keep the same order, and then reverse the order again. So to do that, we're going to create a flip matrix component, and we're going to flip that matrix. Um, I'm going to create a series of curves down here, and we're going to reverse the order of these um, curves coming out of this partition list, and then I'm going to flip the matrix of those guys as well. So these are basically our reversed um, matrices, and these are our um, non-reversed ones. Then we're going to dispatch. So I'm going to dispatch with the true or false pattern, coming the same out of both. Dispatch that guy as well. And then we're going to weave these two patterns together. I'm going to weave list A from this one and list A from this one. And then I'm going to flip that matrix back so we get the data structure that we had initially, like this. And then we should be able to flatten that guy. So that's the logic there. I'll just make it a bit bigger so it's quite easy to see. Um, then we should be able to flatten that guy and do another list item and just check that order now. So I'm going to go and do list item. Um, I'll make it a value of 20 again and we'll just check the order of that. So as we go up in, um, we'll start from over here. As we go along in this line, oh, we've got a little bit of an error there with the data structure. Uh, yeah, so I mean, let's just invert that list pattern actually. Um, so there we go. Now, now if we go it again, sorry, I just forgot that well, you probably could actually use list B in hindsight, but let's just go with the inverted dispatch pattern there. Um, then we go all the way up, up one, up another, and now we've got that kind of like singular polyline 3D printing logic that we've been looking for. So now that we've kind of got the printing logic working nicely, we can start to look at how we might turn this into a uh, ro robotic toolpath simulation. So let's go over to the robots plugin and we're going to go to the components tab and just set up a load um, robot system. So if you've gone ahead and um, installed the plugin correctly and um, copied the libraries file into your documents folder and renamed it as a robots folder, you'll have this whole list of robots available to you. The one that I'm going to use is the Bartlett IRB1600. Um, it looks like that. It's not a big robot, it's quite small, um, but that's the robot system that I'm going to use to begin with.
we're going to go ahead to the components um, tab and we're going to create a program. Um, so the robot system we're going to use is, you know, this robot system that will plug into here. And we need to give this um, this system a bunch of targets. And the targets will essentially re relate to the control points of all these polyline curves that we've created. So um, I'm going to go to um, components and I'm going to um, navigate to create target. Um, so the planes that we're going to um, use to create this target from are going to come from this flip matrix. I'm going to grab the control points from the matrix um, and we're going to make them into XY planes um, like this. But I'm going to flip these planes. So I'm going to get the flip plane component, this little pink one here, um, plug that into there. And this will be all of our target planes. Um, the create target planes actually has an extra set of um, options. So if you right click on it, you can open up all these extra options. The one that we want to add is the tool input and you'll get a little T for that. And then we're going to go ahead and create our own tool for this. So the two inputs that we're going to affect um, in this tool are going to be the uh, TCP plane um, and the mesh um, of the tool geometry that we're going to input. So I'm just going to um, go and pull this across for a second and we're going to open up our end effectors. So um, I'm going to open up the plastic extruder end effector because basically we're going to think of this as a plastic extrusion um, 3D print. So I'm going to go ahead and create a um, point um, and I'm going to set this as that point there. Um, so that's the end of our end effector basically and that's where the, you know this tool path is going to appear from because that's where all the extrusion would come out um, if we're doing a plastic extrusion simulation. I'm going to put this on a YZ plane um, like that and I'm actually just going to um, rotate the plane um, rotate uh, where is it? rotate plane um, I'm going to make it degrees and I'm just going to rotate it by 90 degrees and that's just um, the way that our robot's going to be holding this end effector or this plastic extruder um, when it's running the simulation. So then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reference in a um, brep which is going to be this plastic extruder. I'm just going to go and select the objects from that and reference those guys in. I'm going to mesh the brep with just standard settings and then mesh join like that and join those meshes into there. So um, that's going to be like our tool that we use. So I'm going to just plug that tool into the create target now and then I'm going to apply that target into the targets one component there. So um, this create program will be orange. There's always some warnings in the program. You can go and have a look at them yourself if you want. Um, oh, we actually want to get some flattens. We don't want those to be data structures coming out of there. So let's flatten coming out of um, those control points there. Yep, like that. So the warnings will be something about, you know, position and orientation changes, but we're not going to obviously run this real program, so don't worry too much. As long as our code doesn't, like, turn red and have, like, rotation axial areas with the robot, we're going to be okay. Um, so then the next thing we want to do is we want to actually simulate the program itself. So I am going to go to components again and we're going to get a program simulation component. I'm going to plug program into there and I'm going to make sure normalize is set to true in this time because that means that our time is in between a value of 0 and 1 and I'll just make a number slider that's you know 1.000. Um, so that'll actually straight away put us at the end of our whole program. I'm going to go right back to the start like this and um, you can kind of see already we're starting to get this simulation. So we start at the bottom here and very slowly we kind of move across and um, this simulation is going to run that um, 3D printing um, plastic simulation all together. So I'm going to maybe preview a few of these guys off. Um, and we basically want to set it up so we can see this. I might just turn that plastic extruder geometry off uh, and the end effectors. We want to be able to see this kind of appear as our robot moves. One thing I am going to do is I'm going to create a custom preview. Um, and I'm going to make the system meshes coming out of there. Maybe make them like a dark grey colour or something for our robot and our end effector. Um, and then the next thing we want to do is um, we want to come up to the um,
Uh, yeah, so we're going to come to the utilities and go deconstruct program targets. So I'm going to grab the program coming out of here. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us all of the planes that are related to the axes of the robot. So there's like eight axes, I think, on this particular robot, which gives us eight different planes. We just want list item um, zero from these planes. And that'll be basically all of the planes. Um, if I turn that on. Oh, sorry, no, it's not list item zero. It's list item negative one from memory. I'll just change that to negative one. These are going to be all of the planes basically that we're targeting. Yeah, there we go. Um, and we're going to basically do a list split of these planes. And we're going to split at this index. This index is where the simulation's up to at a certain moment in time based on our number slider here, our time number slider. And I'm going to go and create a polyline from all these points here. Preview those guys off and preview that one off there. Um, and I want to preview all of this stuff off back here as well so we can very clearly see this simulation run. So now, as we go and run that simulation, you'll see that our, um, our polyline will kind of update live. So you can see that robot going ahead and 3D printing um, live as a simulation really nicely. Of course, it'd never run this fast because the plastic wouldn't dry quick enough, but straight away we've gone ahead and created like a nice um, 3D printing simulation of that surface. So this is a totally parametric model. Like you could go back and change like some of the numbers right back at the start and it'll still work. So I could change that to like, you know, 27 or something and this will just update um, without any kind of issues at all, um, which is pretty cool. And um, you could go and change the surfaces, you could go and change the base voxel geometry, um, as long as you're able to kind of keep that continuous polyline going through. Um, so that's pretty interesting little kind of algorithm, I think, just to show how you might go and set up a robotic 3D printing simulation. Just as a little bonus side task, the last thing I want to do just for a bit of fun is we're going to run one extra simulation into um, this little setup that we've got going on. And I want you to basically go and um, open the end effect because we're going to turn on the chain sh chainsaw um, uh, layer and I'm going to reference in this curve here. So I'm going to go set one curve and then I'm going to go ahead and plug this curve into control points here. In fact, actually, let's no, let's do something different. Let's get the perp frames out of it. It'll just be a bit easy control. I might just give it like 400 perp frames. This will just create a bunch of frames on this polyline curve. You can kind of see there a bunch of planes. And I'm going to plug these frames into this um, flip plane here. Um, and then I am going to go ahead and create a mesh component up here. I might call it chainsaw. Oops. And let's go and set one mesh, which is this little chainsaw mesh that we've got here that's sitting on the chainsaw layer. And I'm going to plug that in as my end effector. So now we've got, uh, quite interestingly, a little chainsaw going on the end of our robot. So I've seen a couple of research papers lately which are looking at this. I'm not exactly sure what the research is, but it seems like a little bit of a laugh to me. Um, and you can go ahead and do these kind of like chainsaw robot simulations based on these tool paths, which is pretty badass. So you can go ahead really and create your own little tools to um, put onto your... Um, your robot and then run the simulations however you want. So now I've got a chainsaw stuck onto the end of the robot. So I hope you liked this tutorial. If you did, just hit the subscribe button on our channel. And if you've um, got an idea for a project that you'd like to see in Project of the Week, just leave a comment at the bottom of this video um, and tell me what you think and what you'd like to see in the future.